Hi again, Dr. Ken here with you. AC Lesson 2, Part 2. So here we've got um, Phase Relationships, Slides 10 to 26. And what we mean by Phase Relationships, we need any voltage which has magnitude and direction we call a phase. That's where the word phase comes from. So below here on what you can see are oscilloscopes. Oscilloscopes are just flash voltmeters. They're voltmeters that can display a positive and a negative part of a voltage against time. And you can have normally on most um, oscilloscopes two channels. So you can have two voltmeters operating at the same time. And that's what we have here. So if we come down and we look at uh, the horizontal line through this oscilloscope, above the line, in this direction, are positive voltages. Below the line, here, and down below the line, are negative voltages. And if we were to look or think about the wave in a horizontal perspective, this is time moving from left to right. So if we look at this first oscilloscope on the left-hand side, we have two waveforms. You can see their peak magnitudes are a little bit different. That's okay. It means they're just going to have different values or different RMS values, different peak values. So you can see two waveforms. But you'll notice that they cross over. Their zero points occur at the same time. You'll also notice that their peak values also occur at the same time positive and their peak values negative are also occurring at the same time. So we would say these two waveforms or these two phasors are in phase with each other. They are rising together to their maximum. They're coming back to their minimum together. They're crossing the zero at the same time and then they're going to their maximum negative at the same time and coming back. So we would say that they are in phase or the phase relationship between them in time is zero. Zero time between them and zero degrees, therefore, between them. Let's, let's look at this second oscilloscope. We've got the same two waveforms. One with a lower amplitude, one with a higher amplitude. But you'll notice that if we start here on the left-hand side, our smaller waveform is reaching its maximum positive, but waveform number one is reaching its maximum waveform negative at the same time. They're crossing over at the same time instant in time, crossing over zero at the same time, but they are exactly opposite to each other. So we would say they are 180 degrees out of phase. So wave starts here, goes through zero, comes back. This wave is starting negative, coming through zero and arriving back here. So you can see their zero crossing is at the same point, but their maximum and their minimums are happening at the direct opposite time to each other. So these two waveforms would be said to be 180 degrees out of phase. So what is phase difference? And we've got a couple of examples here on the screen for you to look at. Let's look at the first example. And we've got two waveforms. Waveform 1 is in green and is coming to its maximum and then coming to zero. But waveform 2, which is in blue, was already negative. And it's now only just coming up to be positive. So we would say that waveform 1 is getting to its positive point well before waveform 2, so we would say waveform 1 leads waveform 2. On the horizontal axis, which is time, 
and time can be turned into degrees. So the time difference or the phase angle difference, you could choose to measure it where they cross over at zero, which is often the best way to do it because it's nice and easy. But I could have measured it at peak to peak. I could have taken those two points. As long as you're picking the same two major points, it doesn't matter where you measure it. So on this particular waveform, waveform one, the green one, leads waveform two by X number of degrees. We could also say, and this can get a little bit confusing, that waveform two lags waveform one. So again, it just depends where your point of reference is. Are we going to say waveform one leads waveform two? That is correct. Does waveform two lag waveform one? Yes, it does. So both statements are true. It just depends on where your point of reference is. Now we're going to look at diagram B. Here, waveform 2 is lagging behind waveform 1. So waveform 1 is lagging in this particular case. You can see here waveform 2 is reaching its positive first. Waveform 1 is reaching its positive second. So waveform 2 leads waveform 1 or waveform 1 lags waveform 2. Again, you can say it in either direction or either way. You can express it either way. It just depends, again, what your point of reference is. And is the phase difference is the amount of angle or the amount of time taken between two similar points or the two same points on each of the waves. And as I've mentioned previously, doing that at the zero crossover point is most often the easiest because that's where you can see it easily on the oscilloscope. So the two voltages are out of phase with each other by X number of degrees, and it could be a lag situation, it could be a lead situation, depending on how you're going to express it. So, phase diagrams. We need to learn a little bit about those now. So in a phase diagram, each sine wave is shown as a straight line drawn at an angle equal to its phase difference. That's why we introduce you to phase difference. The length of the line represents the value or the voltage of the current, normally in RMS. So it's important to remember the length of the line represents the value of the voltage or the current in RMS. Each line is called a phaser. And I'll be showing you shortly that phases not only have magnitude and length, they have angle as we've just described, but they're also rotating anti-clockwise. A diagram showing a number of phases is called a phase diagram. So there are some conventions that we need to know around phase diagrams. Now they are only conventions. There's no particular reason why, it's just that when we started developing phasor diagrams, we had to have some consistency. So these are the conventions. Voltage phases are drawn with an open arrowhead, and you'll see that in the diagrams we'll look at shortly. An open arrowhead. Current phases are drawn with a closed arrowhead. So we close it in and we color it in. The arrowhead of a phaser is the tip like an arrow, the tip of an arrow, and the start end of a phaser is called the tail. If you, again, if you're looking at it, arrows, it would be where the flight of the arrows are. So the back is the tail and the sharp end is the tip. There's always a reference phaser, which is a horizontal line drawn from left to right. I mean, you'll see that in a diagram, we'll have a look at it at the moment. There's always a reference phaser, 
which is horizontal line drawn from the left to the right. And it's actually drawn from a place on the graph called the origin. That's also important to remember. So our phase of reference is always drawn from the origin to the right horizontally. Each phaser is always drawn to scale. If we don't draw them to scale, we won't be able to do the geometric additions and subtractions with them and scale off reasonable values. So each phaser has to be drawn to scale. And once you've selected a scale, you've got to stick to it. Phasers are assumed to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. So as we move through, you'll get used to that. So phases are assumed to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. Why? Because it's the convention. Again, just a convention. So I found some great YouTube videos. They're only, you know, a few minutes long, except for the, uh, the one at the end, the phaser for extended learning, 25 minutes. But if you've got 25 minutes, it's really worthwhile. So the first one is I can't run the videos here but a simple phaser addition uh, only takes about uh, three minutes um, adding triangles this is what phaser addition actually is and it runs for three minutes so a phaser is just a way of drawing a triangle and adding phases in series circuits again three and a half minutes doesn't take long to watch and phases in extended learning. So uh, I provide the links for these on uh, the e-learning site at the end of the lesson so you can uh, go and have a uh, bit of a look at those. They're very very helpful. So here's our first phaser diagram that has no phase difference. There is a phase relationship but there is no phase difference. And you'll see what I mean by that very shortly. If we first look at our circuit diagram over here to the right, we have an AC supply of some kind. We have two resistors, and we're going to get a voltage drop V1, shown by the green color. We're going to get a voltage drop V2, shown by the blue color. And we're going to get a current shown here in red and we're going to draw the phase diagrams now we come back to the to the uh, phase shape the red one is the current the blue one is v2 and the green one is v1 and you'll notice they all cross zero together at the same time they all achieve their maximums positive at the same time and they all achieve their maximums negative at the same time therefore we say they are in phase or there is no phase difference the phase angle in this particular case is an angle of zero so there's no difference in time there's no difference in angle so we say they are in phase so we're going to draw in our diagram and again if we had some graph paper where i've got my cursor is the origin and we would draw from the left to the right the red phaser. So the red phaser is sitting underneath the green and the blue phaser at the moment. They're underneath. So that would be our reference phaser. The reason we're using the current or the red one as the reference phaser, this is a series circuit. It's two resistors connected in series. Therefore, the one constant in the circuit is current. So we're going to use the thing that's constant in the circuit as our reference. So we then plot our 100 volts. So here's our green phaser. Its length represents 100 volts. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 110 volts per division and we scale off and we draw in on the horizontal because there's no angular difference then we draw in our v2 
and we're doing a phaser addition here. We're just going to top to tail, so we're going to add this phaser in on top. We could have drawn it down here and then moved it up, but we've drawn it straight top to tail, and you'll see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 65. It's been drawn in to scale at 65. So the overall addition is the volts total, which is 165 volts. So the voltage total applied to this circuit is the phaser addition of V1 plus V2. Because they're in phase, it's also the algebraic addition. So you might say, Ken, why did you drive us through this phaser diagram when I could simply add 100 to 65? Well, in this particular case, and when things are in phase, we can just algebraically add things. But when they're not in phase, it's not so simple. So when things are in phase, yes, we can algebraically add, but we're here demonstrating that we can also add using a simple phase diagram. So here we're going to demonstrate a similar thing again, except this time we've got a phase diagram and we've got a 180 degrees phase difference. So we've got a voltage total applied across the circuit. We've got a voltage drop across a resistor and we've got a voltage two been inserted into the circuit, but you'll notice it is at 180 degrees. It's still a series circuit, and we've still got current as our reference. If you look on our little diagram up the top here that I'm just circling, you can see V1 rises to positive, back to negative, and it is in phase with the current. It's following the current, crossing over at the same places as the current, getting to maximum at the same place as the current, minimum at the same place as the current. Therefore, the V1 is in phase with the current, and we know, in actual fact, it's a resistive component because that's what they do. So we would go from our origin out and draw our current phaser as the reference. Then we would go out and we would draw in our 100 volts, and you can see the green arrow here being drawn over the top. But you'll notice this time, our 65 is at 180 degrees. So instead of drawing our 65 out in this direction, we draw our 65 top to tail back in the opposite direction. So our volt total is in here, being the difference between the two. So we now have, between the origin and the tip of the blue arrow coming back from the, the tip of the green arrow, we have a volts total. So we have, end up, it, what we've just done there is a phaser subtraction rather than a phaser addition. So 100 minus 65, our voltage total is 35 volts being applied to the circuit. So volts total is 35. So again, if we know it's at 180 degrees, we can subtract the voltages around the circuits algebraically. But again, we can also use a phase diagram. So phase diagrams will work when things are in phase and 180 out degrees out of phase. When they're in phase, we can just use algebraic sum. When they're 180 degrees out of phase, we can use algebraic subtraction. We can do it two ways. Now it's going to get a little bit more complex for you. Here we have a phase diagram where we have a voltage which is 30 degrees out of phase. So phase diagram, 30 degrees out of phase, or 30 degrees phase difference. Again, let's look at the circuit diagram. We've got volts one, a resistor, 
an unknown component, creating a voltage drop V2, voltage total applied across the circuit, and the current, again, is our constant because, again, this is a series circuit. You'll notice that the voltage and the current for volts, voltage 1 and the current are in phase, but our voltage 2, you can see they're crossing over at different places. And the diagram tells us there is a 30 degrees shift. In actual fact, it's a 30 degrees lead. So we have here the blue phase, and it's coming up to its maximum 30 degrees before the green phase. It's also getting to its minimum here, 30 degrees, or it's zero crossing, I should say, 30 degrees before the green phase. So there is a 30 degrees phase shift. So how do we do a phaser addition now? Again, our current is the one constant. So from our origin, we draw out our red phaser, closed arrow to indicate that's our reference. Our voltage across the resistor is in phase, so it's drawn on the horizontal because there is no phase angle difference. But this time, we draw our voltage two at 30 degrees, and here where my arrow is, we have to put 30 degrees using a protractor, and we have to project out our 65 volts. So our 65 volts is now leading our 100 volts by 30 degrees from the horizontal. How do we calculate the voltage total? We simply we can either top to tail, we can take the blue phaser and top to tail it out here and find that point. We can also take the green phaser and top to tail it out here. Or if you're like me, I like to just grab a protractor, measure the green arrow with my protractor, put the point on the blue, scribe an arc, measure the blue phase with a with a Compass, sorry, I might have said protractor, with a compass, put my compass on here and scribe an arc. So by using a compass to measure the length, going to the opposite phaser, scribing an arc, where the two arcs cross each other, we end up with this thing called a parallelogram. And where the two lines cross is that point there. We simply project that point back to the origin. The length of the line is the voltage total, and the angle between the line and the horizontal is what we call the phase angle. So the voltage total will have both magnitude and it will have an angle in here. So again, this is now doing this, the same drawing, but with a little bit more detail in it now. We've drawn our 100 volts to scale. We've drawn our 65 to scale. When we've found this point, either using top to tail or parallelogram method, we simply project back, scale it off and measure it, and it comes in at 159 0.6. Let's round that to 160 volts, it's close enough. And we've got something in the order of about 11.75, or probably you'd measure it off at close enough to 12 degrees. When we're using protractors and geometry to do these things, it can only be a reasonable estimation. We're never going to be hyper, hyper accurate, depending on the thickness of your pencil and the accuracy of your scale. So in this particular case, we have a voltage total on our diagram, and it is leading the current by an angle of 11.75 degrees. And that's because voltage V2 was leading by 65 volts at 
30 degrees. So the value of the applied voltage Vt is found by measuring the length of the phasor on the complete phasor diagram. The phase difference between Vt and the current is also measured from the diagram. We can also use a mathematical solution for those of you who uh, are bits of maths brainiacs. Most of the time we'll use a phasor diagram, but you can solve the problem mathematically and uh, <clears throat> we could simply go what's the cos of the angle 30 V2 and we would get 0 0.866 times 65 giving us 56.2 um, the Y so we've again we're just playing with triangles here we've calculated the X using trigonometry we're now going to calculate the y using the sine of the angle. So 0 0.5 times 65, our y value or our y height. There's our triangle, so our y height would come in at uh, 32.5. Then uh, now we have two sides of the triangle. We can now say the tan of the angle is the y divided by 100 plus x, so that's the 100 plus x is 100 volts plus the x amount that we got so we get 32.5 divided by 156 and you notice we're going to go 10 to the minus 1 and it's going to give our answer straight back in degrees and there's our 11.75 so we've been able to work out what that angle is simply by finding out the full length of this triangle and its height and therefore work out the hypotenuse. Um, the volts total, again, it's just a matter of now calculating the hypotenuse of the triangle. So the volts total is equal going to be the y side divided by the sine of the angle. So we're going to use sine, so 32.5 multiplied by the sine of 11.75 is going to be 32.5 divided by 0.204 giving us 159.6 volts. So if you love maths and trigonometry we could have worked out the whole thing just using the trigonometry of um, the diagram or we can simply scale it off our phasor diagram. Mathematical solution slightly more accurate of course. So what about a phasor diagram where we've got a lagging phase shift? I mean, it's the same, but only a little bit different. You'll notice here on our diagram, we've got V2 lags V1. So V2, sorry, V1, the green one, is in phase with the current. So the green one, if you look on our diagram, is a resistor. The current is constant and V2 is the unknown component. This time the unknown component is lagging behind by 30 degrees. So again, to do this with a phasor diagram, we would set our origin, we would project out horizontally to indicate our current as the reference, we would scale in and draw our 100 volts, we would then draw our 65 volts at the appropriate angle and in here again it's 30 degrees so we would be 30 degrees in here. We can either top to tail or parallelogram and either way we find that point and then we project back giving us our volts total. So in this particular case the voltage will be the same, it'll be about 160 volts but it will be at negative 12 degrees rather than positive 12 degrees because we originally 30 degrees in the lag situation rather than on the top of the line, which is the lead situation. So here's the mathematics for it again. We've simply got our 100 volts on the horizontal, our 65 projecting down at 30 degrees, We've topped the tail to 
uh, parallelogrammed using to find uh, this far point projected back and we get 165 as we anticipated but this time we're at minus 11.75 because we're lagging behind V1. So V total is found by measuring the length of its phaser from the complete phaser diagram. The phase difference between volts total and the current is also measured from the diagram. So via phaser diagrams and a parallel circuit. So at the moment, we've been doing phaser diagrams for series circuits, but what about a phaser diagram for a parallel circuit? In a parallel circuit, voltage is common to all branches. Therefore, in, a phase, in this kind of phaser diagram, the reference phaser is now the voltage rather than the current. The phases are for the currents in each of the branches rather than the voltages around the circuit and each current phaser is drawn to scale at an angle to show its phase relationship to the reference phaser, which in this case is going to be voltage. So here's a quick little example. We've got an AC supply. We look at the diagram on the right hand side. So voltage across the circuit is always the same. At any point across the circuit, the voltage is the same. We've been told that we have 7 amps at 40 degrees lead and 8 amps at 20 degrees lag. And we would like to find the current total. Again, Kirchhoff's law for current is going to be used. The total values or the total currents into the node must equal the current total currents leaving the node. So in this case, we have got to draw our phaser diagram so let's have a look at the phaser diagram in detail on the horizontal we've got voltage we then draw in our 7 amps at 40 degrees lead so here's our 7 amps scaled in and been drawn in at 40 degrees above the horizontal because above the horizontal is the lead position Remembering our phaser diagram is rotating anti-clockwise. Just follow my arrow, anti-clockwise this way. So as the phaser diagram rotates on the top side, this will always lead by 40 degrees. Then we're told from the diagram that at 8 amps, we've got 20 degrees lag. So we scale out our 8 amps at 20 degrees but it's lag so it's minus 20 degrees in this direction we can either take our orange phaser and top to tail it to find that point or we could take our green phaser and top to tail it or we could take our compass and measure out this put the top of our compass on the opposite phaser scribe an arc take this length measure it with our compass put our point of our compass here Scribe another arc where the two arcs cross is where that point must be. Once having found the point using top to tail or using <coughs> a parallelogram, we then project back to centre to the origin and that point there, the length of that line becomes the total current. So when we scale that off, we get 13 amps and if we measure with our protractor, we'll find it's about 7.8 degrees. I'd be happy with 7 or 8. So parallel circuit with two branch currents out of phase with the applied voltage and the phaser diagram to find the total current and its phase angle. Same principle. And again, if you didn't already notice, we had a scale of one division equals one amp. So with your drawing phaser diagrams for voltage or phaser diagrams for current it's very important that you know and understand what scale you're working with or you're going to end up with some wrong values now we could have equally done this with mathematics so here's the mathematical solution um, x1 so we're finding the base of the triangle for the seven amps that's what x1 is 
it's just the horizontal component of the triangle and cos 40 so we're going to have 0.766 times 7 going to give us 5.3 we can also find y1 which is the horizontal sorry the vertical component of that phaser of the first current and sine 40 so 0.642 times 7 gives us 4.5 Similarly, we can find the X and the Y component for the second phaser, for the 8 amp phaser, which is going to give us a horizontal component of 7.25 and a vertical component of 2.74. So our voltage total is simply adding up the triangles. So, sorry, get, we need to get, sorry, get an X total and a Y total. So, first we're going to get the X total. We add the 5.36 and the 7.82. We are just adding triangles together. So, we're adding the horizontal component of the two triangles. We're adding the two vertical components of the triangles. Which gives us an overall of 12.88 for X1 and X2. That's this one here, X1 and X2. There's the overall of the base of the big triangle and the y of the triangle is 1.76 so here's our 1.76 y1 minus y2 so all we've done is find the base of the big triangle the horizontal sorry the vertical of the big triangle and now we're simply going to use tan to calculate what the angle is in here so tan will be y total minus divided by x total and it gives us 7.78 degrees to find the hypotenuse of the triangle doesn't matter which one you use but they've used sine in this example so the y total that's the y total here the black line I'm just tracing it with my cursor we're simply 1.76 divided by the sine of 7.82 gives us this ratio which gives us 13 amps. So if you understand that phasor diagrams are just, we're just adding and subtracting triangles and triangles can simply be added and subtracted by adding up all the horizontal components, adding up all the vertical components. Once you've got that, you can use tan to work out the angles you can use sine or cos to then work out the hypotenuse of the triangle. So it's just triangles within triangles is the mathematical solution. Time and degrees. Um, you'll find that this equation is not on your sheet, so you need to pay attention here for a minute. If we look at this phase, uh, um, phase drawing of an oscilloscope you can see we have a green phase and a blue phase there is a time difference between them and again as, as I mentioned on an oscilloscope it's much easier to mention to measure it at the zero crossing points so the periodic time from the start of one wave in this case the start of the green one to the finish of the green one is the periodic time the time difference is the time in here. Remember, we're measuring on the horizontal, so we're interested in the time division. You can see here on our oscilloscope, we're on one millisecond. So one of these blocks is worth one millisecond. So we've got here, we've got one, two, three, and a half. So three and a half milliseconds is the periodic time. And the time difference is about half a millisecond. So the time difference is half of one of these divisions, or half of one millisecond. You can see over here on the selector switch, on what we call the sweep, or the time, of the oscilloscope. So the time difference is 0.5 of a millisecond. The periodic time is 3 milliseconds. So from the previous example, determine the phase angle between the two waveforms. So 
So the solution is the periodic time is 3.5, the time difference is 0.5, what's the phase angle? So here's the equation, phase angle is equal to the time difference divided by periodic time. Now I'd like you to get out your equation sheets, your Ken equation sheets, find a, a nice spot where you can write that equation in, it doesn't exist on our equation sheet for some reason. So phase angle equals time difference divided by periodic time multiplied by 360 to put it into degrees. So this ratio multiplied by 360 is converting it to degrees. So here we have 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 because it's in milliseconds divided by 3.5 times 10 to the minus 3 again for milliseconds multiplied by 360 and our angled answer is there is actually 51 point four degrees between them. So that ends lesson number two, part two.